Okay. The objectives for the presentation that we hope to be able to obtain today or accomplish today, I want to present and describe some of the common injuries that affect racket sports, tennis, picketball, and racquetball. There are a lot of them. You may think by the time we're done with that component of things, it's like, why am I getting into these sports or what have you? That's not intended to be the case at all. Because a lot of the injuries that we're going to talk about are things that could happen, not must or necessarily will happen. And related to that, we want to talk about and identify the causative factors for some of these injuries. And then probably more practically, suggest strategies for the prevention of these injuries. Now, this is meant as basically a summary sort of topic, or some people would call it an introductory sort of topic. If anyone attending here has interest in more information, we are happy to develop webinars or teaching materials or what have you that would become more specific. So if, for, for example, if you would like to see a program in the future dealing with nothing but tennis, or nothing but pickleball, or nothing but racquetball, let us know, provide us feedback, and we'll be happy to try to put something together using our resources to provide the best current, but also practical information, because we're in this to try to help folks and keep everyone healthy and participating versus on the sideline wishing that they could participate. So let's move forward here and in no particular order, kind of starting from the top down and you'll see on the right hand side, you'll see this tennis player and she's gonna kind of serve as the model, so to speak, in terms of some of the injury discussion. And as we go down, you'll see some of these things highlight and then go not highlighted in talking about some of these various injuries. The information for this is coming from a variety of different sources. It's certainly nothing that I've made up or anything of that regard, but the basic post of uh, the information comes from places such as the United States Olympic Committee, the basically national or known as the national governing bodies such as United States Tennis Association, United States Racquetball Association, United States Pickleball Association, also from the American College of Sports Medicine, the American Physical Therapy Association, the American uh, Association of Orthopedic Surgeons, and the American Society for Sports Medicine. So in no particular order, one of the possible things that playing a racket sport, whether it's tennis, racquetball, pickleball, squash, table tennis, is the possibility of a rotator cuff involvement. Now the rotator cuff involves many different possibilities from things that are a nuisance to things that might require surgical correction. And there's a very broad spectrum of those sorts of things. We could spend an entire afternoon talking about all the different nuances between these things, but we're just gonna kind of highlight some things here. Now, as an aside, my colleague, Casey Sawinski, who is the managing director of our Freeland facility, will be presenting a webinar next month specific to the rotator cuff. Casey does a very good job. And so this would be another opportunity if you do have more information, or pardon me, if you do wish more information on the rotator cuff, self-management and figuring out how to help yourself, I'd advise you or respectfully suggest you Take a look at Casey's webinar, either on in either online live when he presents it or in a recorded form after the fact. But let's get back to the topic at hand here. With the rotator cuff, there are many possibilities, one of which is known as an impingement syndrome. An impingement syndrome occurs when one or more of the tendons of the rotator cuff, as the name implies, gets pinched or impinged between the acromion, which is the point of the shoulder, and the head of the humerus, the ball, the ball and socket joint. The usual tendon that happens most of the time is called the supraspinatus tendon. And that tendon comes from the muscle that's back here on your shoulder, comes across and or attaches on the back of the humerus. 
And impingement syndrome basically comes from a variety of different things that we'll talk about when we get into talking about what we call EMO later on. The impingement syndrome is something that should be correctable in most cases. It does require some degree of intervention. Usually these things do not uh, relieve themselves or correct themselves without some degree of, inter of intervention. You can't just rest and take off the sport for a while or take away from the sport for a while without um, out being successful in terms of correcting the problem. The impingement syndrome, if it is not corrected, can develop into more of a tendonitis into other parts of the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff has four tendons. It usually starts in the supraspinatus with the impingement syndrome. But if uncorrected, that tendonitis or that irritation can spread into other parts of the rotator cuff. Once you get tendonitis in the rotator cuff, it requires some degree of intervention through medication, through physical therapy, through controlled activity or corrected stroke mechanics, because if left untreated, a tendonitis can develop into a partial tear of the rotator cuff. And this is where things become troublesome because this would be a scenario where not only would the person have problems playing tennis or racquetball or picketball, pickleball, they'd have difficulty, in some cases, great difficulty just doing routine activities, such as simply picking up your toothbrush to brush your teeth. And if left untreated, the end stage would be a complete tear of the rotator cuff. And this is certainly not a desirable situation it requires a surgical correction. And basically, in this case, your shoulder does not become usable because you simply cannot lift your arm up to do basic things like reaching for a shelf, let alone serving a tennis ball, racquetball, or, or a pickleball. Now, it doesn't happen that often, but it is possible to experience an actual dislocation at the shoulder an actual dislocation primarily of the acromioclavicular joint called the AC joint, which is this area up here. If you feel around a little bit, you'll feel a natural little divot as you come out from your collarbone to the point of your shoulder. And basically what happens here is that this joint and the ligaments that support it become strained or ruptured and that causes basically that joint to dislocate. Back in the day using that terminology, this used to be called a shoulder separation and usually occurred more in contact sports, collision sports like football, wrestling, et cetera. But it can occur in racquetball sports. How does it occur? It usually occurs with some degree of impact. You don't see it as often in tennis, looking at the statistics, as you would in, say, racquetball, because, of course, in racquetball, you've got the walls. And if you hit the wall, chances are something's going to give, and it's probably not going to be the wall. The other situation that we need to be aware of is that sometimes people can actually dislocate their glenohumeral joint. The glenohumeral joint is the shoulder joint proper. It's basically the ball and socket up here at the shoulder, and either through impacting the wall or through some sort of abnormal stroke mechanic with either a pickup ball paddle or a tennis racket. But more likely when this happens, it happens more out of frustration. There are instances at least uh, recorded by the United States Tennis Federation where people experience shoulder dislocations because they're so upset with a missed shot or a missed call from an umpire or one of the linesmen, line judges, that they basically have a tantrum and hit the net with the racket or pound the racket onto the court or whatever else. And guess what? They dislocate their shoulder. Shoulder dislocations, acromial cavicular dislocations typically are things that are so uncomfortable, you're going to want to get help, usually not necessarily a 911 call, but that sort of thing. It's not anything you're going to want to try to continue playing or try to just kind of work it out or go home and rest it. These are painful and these require usually some degree of professional intervention to avoid further complications. 
Okay, moving on a little bit. We have this thing that's called tennis elbow, which is more appropriately called lateral epicondylitis. That's probably why they call it tennis elbow, because how do you like to go around saying lateral epicondylitis? Well, anyway, what we're talking about is at the elbow itself, the epicondyle is the outer place here where the forearm and the upper arm come together to form the elbow joint. And in this area here, there are a fair number of tendons that connect and other sorts of muscles and soft tissue. And what can happen over time, because this is not just a tennis injury, this would happen in any sort of racket, any sort of racket sports injury. It can also happen in any kind of throwing sports injury. It's not out of the realm of reasonability that a football quarterback can develop tennis elbow or a ball, baseball pitcher can develop tennis elbow. Basically what happens is this area becomes irritated for a variety of different reasons. This can lead to or be accompanied by such things as sprains of the ligaments on the inside or the outside of the elbow, primarily the inside being more of a concern because that has more of a stabilizer function at the elbow itself. The elbow has collateral ligaments. We're more familiar with the term collateral ligaments at the knee, which help provide stability side to side. But the collateral ligaments at the elbow serve a very similar structure. And if for some reason you miss hit the ball, whether it's a tennis paddle, racket, or squash ball, or your stroke mechanics are off, or you're just too tired, or it's just simply a bad accident, too much pressure being applied to the area can cause irritation, which leads to inflammation, which leads to a ligament sprain, or as is listed there, it could lead to bursitis of the elbow, where things just basically kind of swell up to the point of it looks like there's a golf ball on your elbow. It can lead to ongoing tendonitis, not just for the lateral epicondyle, but for other parts of the elbow. And it can lead to an ulnar neuritis, which is the ulnar nerve comes in this area here on the inside. This is your quote, funny bone, so to speak. But over time and without appropriate intervention, elbow problems, racket sport related, can develop a long-term sort of irritation and problem here at the ulnar nerve. And this is not a happy circumstance because basically you lose function at the wrist. It almost feels like a carpal tunnel syndrome. It's a different case, but it is a nerve sort of problem. And it does require some degree of professional intervention. Moving on down, racket sports are not just about the shoulder or the wrist or the hand. They also involve the legs and things. At the knee joint, the patella, you can develop various types of patellar tendinopathy, patellar pain syndromes, and related sorts of things. Anterior knee pain, your kneecap hurts versus pain on the side or pain in the back. Bursitis, there are, fairly, there are several bursa around the knee and the patellofemoral joint around the kneecap. And if those get irritated, they're going to swell up to the point where, again, it may look like there's a ping pong ball or a golf ball coming out of your knee. From ancient times, this was referred to as, quote, housemaid's knee, because who got this? People who were on their knees doing housework. And of course, we're not going to talk about what was then versus now in terms of some of the, you know, the sociological or political sorts of things. But realize that if you're playing a racket sport, you not only have to worry or necessarily be concerned about the shoulder and the elbow and the wrist and the hand, you need to be concerned about the lower body as well. All of these sports are total body sports. And most sports and games that people play nowadays are total body games. So it's not just focusing on the shoulder or the elbow, it's realizing that you can also end up with problems further on down the body. Certainly over time, if people are having problems, if they're having symptoms, and if things are not dealt with, you can develop osteoarthritic changes. The circumstance where the articular cartilage at the knee joint or at the patellofemoral joint, the kneecap joint, 
start wearing on one another like two sets of friction from sandpaper. And this leads to deterioration of the cartilage. It can lead to what's called a patellofemoral pain syndrome. It could lead to patellar tendonitis. Bottom line, over time, it's joint deterioration and degeneration, which if not corrected or compensated for, will eventually need to the possibility of surgery. And hopefully not, but possibly total joint replacement. Again, these are things that might happen if people don't take care of themselves or seek appropriate services if needed. They, it's not a situation of it must happen. Other sorts of things. People who play racket sports are subjected to such changes of directions and different sorts of movements and things that you can develop various sorts of things uh, related to or analogous to stress fractures. If you have a bunion and you don't have the appropriate sort of mechanics or strength or balance, you can develop more and more wear and tear, more and more abnormal force on your big toe and it will exacerbate the bunion. So it kind of looks like the old fashioned situations of gout, but basically it interferes with the ability of your foot to work, which then very quite frankly messes up your tennis game or your racquetball game because it's hard to function and perform. General foot pain, these sorts of things occur We'll talk about why these sorts of things occur, but looking at it the other way, if you're getting pain from playing these sorts of situations, it's not a natural sort of thing. It becomes a scenario of trying to just determine why am I getting this pain? How long have I been getting this pain? And probably more importantly, how can I stop the pain once I have it? And that's where you might need the services of a sports medicine professional. Playing racket sports with all the different stops and start sorts of things can lead to the development of hammer toes, which might not seem like much of a big thing until you get into your 50s, 60s, 70s and above, and then it becomes very, very uncomfortable. You could also develop a Morton's neuroma in between the tarsal bones of your foot. And this is not a happy circumstance because quite frankly, if you've ever, if you've known someone who has this scenario, or if you've ever had this yourself, it basically hurts with every step you take. As with that, as we mentioned the knee, a lot of this wear and tear over time can cause osteoarthritis, which if not corrected for, compensated for, will only further deteriorate. And eventually you get to the point of possible surgical correction. And it becomes very difficult to kind of do some of these things consistently in terms of trying to play the game when you've got these problems going on. Imbalance or other sorts of things or abnormal stroke mechanics or just general lack of condition can also influence the arch of the feet. You can develop a pes cavus, which is known as a high arch, or you can develop a pes planus known as a fallen arch. Conversely, if you already have one of these things, you might need a change in footwear in order to adapt to or adapt your foot, your own mechanics, your own anatomy to playing the sport with safety and with a minimal risk of injury. It's not just putting on a tennis shoe, it's making sure you've got the correct tennis shoe for your particular needs. As we'll talk about in just a little bit later, it means a tennis shoe for playing tennis, not necessarily a tennis shoe for playing racquetball or a pickleball shoe for playing tennis. It's getting the appropriate equipment and the appropriate footwear. And with the technology exists today, it is possible to help people who have a naturally high arch or who have a fallen arch play these sports with a minimal risk of discomfort and a minimal risk of injury. And it doesn't take tons and tons of special training or equipment or a huge investment. Okay, hamstring strains. The hamstring is the, you know, the group of muscles on the back of your leg. It is not uncommon at all for people who play any type of sport to develop some type of a hamstring strain. This can 
be the symptom, uh, the symptoms of this might be pain in your buttock region up high on basically kind of the area that you sit on, the ischial tuberosity. It can result in cramping of the back of your leg. It can basically, as this thing develops, it's gonna be difficult to run. It's gonna be difficult to walk. You might get, get compensatory hip pain. You might get pain in the posterior part of your knee. You might get uh, pain throughout the entire leg. It's just one of these situations that we need to realize that muscles can get very easily irritated playing racket sports. But even though they can get very easily irritated, there are, some, there are several ways to help prevent this from happening, which we'll talk about in the second half of the presentation. So it's another situation of this will not necessarily happen, but one needs to be aware of it to try to prevent it from happening. Or if unfortunately it has happened, do some things to get it under control as quickly as possible because people would rather be participating pain-free without some of these problems. At the knee, potentially also at the ankle or even the hip or even the lower back, but at the knee, there's the possibility of a cartilage tear. And in this case, we're talking about the knee because of the special cartilages there, the two meniscal cartilages. We're not talking about the articular cartilages. The articular cartilage is the, is the shiny substance that covers every bone in a you know, typical bone system. That's the stuff if it gets irritated and deteriorates, causes osteoarthritis. We're talking here about the two shock absorbing cart cartilages, I almost said cartridges, cartilages, one on the inside, one on the outside of each knee. The lateral being the outside, the medial being on the inside. These help to deepen the joint surface of the tibiofemoral joint and help to make the overall quote hinge more efficient. These get more notoriety in sports such as football and lacrosse or ice hockey where these injuries occur more frequently. But we have to be aware of them for tennis because if it is going to occur, one wants to be aware of it to, again, compensate for it and prevent it from getting worse. In general, and it's not necessarily com completely meaning a structural problem or a complete tear or what have you. You can irritate a meniscus and produce pain in things, but it doesn't mean, oh my gosh, I need to have surgery. For example, lateral meniscus would be pain on the outside joint line of the knee where the big bone, the femur, and the smaller bone, the tibia come together at the knee itself. Early on, a meniscal irritation is going to be reflected by pain on the outside joint line. Over time, if the meniscus continues to ir be irritated, if the inflammation doesn't correct itself, if the problem is not taken care of, it will deteriorate to the point of clicking. We get an audible sort of click when you're taking steps or things like that. The clicking is with pain. And eventually, if things really deteriorate to the point of a full meniscal tear, your knee's going to lock up. And literally, you're not going to be able to move it. And that's a surgical uh, uh, correction. On the other side, you get similar sorts of things. The medial meniscus, irritations reflected by pain on the inside of the joint line. This, again, will deteriorate into clicking and then eventually to locking up and a surgical correction if not taken care of. So another thing to be aware of. Now, as you're going on, we're seeing all kinds of different injuries and things here. And you might be thinking, why in the world did I ever get into this sport? And that's not what we're trying to say. We're just saying these are things to be aware of, but not lose sleep over. But if you start getting symptoms in some of these areas, these are things that might be going on and might be in your best interest to get at least looked at or consulted by your primary care provider, your physical therapist, someone who knows what they're talking about and someone who can help you get through this problem, correct it and get back to playing without discomfort. Getting down at the lower part 
of the leg are ankle sprains. Most ankle sprains, whether they're in racket sports or other sports occur on the outside. It's called a lateral sprain. That happens most frequently. But just because it happens most frequently doesn't mean that it's exclusive to that. You can get medial ankle sprains. You can get high ankle sprains if you follow professional sports or division one college sports. That seems to be something that's got a lot of notoriety as of late. Uh, but basically in most cases, a typical ankle sprain is going to occur on the outside. And this is the proverbial turning your ankle over or stepping the wrong way and turning your ankle over. This results in a lot of pain and swelling. It's difficult, if not impossible to run, let alone walk, but it's more than just getting rid of the pain and the swelling and recovering from the sprain. Research has indicated that folks who sprain their ankles just by the way the body is working will mess up, for lack of a better description, their standing balance ability. It's their proprioceptive system, their balance system. And what's been found is that people who have had ankle sprains become more prone to sprains in the future because their balance system has not yet returned to 100% normal. There appears to be a lag and why this lag occurs is yet to be discovered by the folks who do this type of medical research. But when you sprain your ankle, it's almost like your balance system in the ankle doesn't shut down, but it becomes less efficient. And it kind of dims down like a dimmer switch versus an on off light switch. And it takes a while for this balance ability to fully come back. And so what this means is that for people going through some form of treatment of ankle sprain and recovery, be it from a physician or a physical therapist or whomever, it means that we need to address or at least investigate the possibility of a balance problem and include balance training in the recovery process. Okay. And then finally, at the bottom, at least finally for the things we're gonna talk about today, we can have problems with the Achilles tendon or in the calf muscle itself. And this is a situation that's hopefully avoidable because Achilles injuries are not happy or are certainly difficult to deal with. The Achilles tendon rupture is not that frequent, but Achilles tendonitis is fairly frequent in racket sports. This is reflected in pain in your calf, usually down by your heel and the Achilles tendon itself. If not dealt with, you very early on can develop a problem walking, difficulty walking. The heel can swell, the heel's gonna be painful, and uniquely enough, if not corrected, this is gonna result in plantar fasciitis by just the way the whole body is connected and the way that the tissues and literally the collagen fibers uh, basically exist through their connections at the heel and into the foot itself. Bottom line, if you have an Achilles tendon problem, it doesn't have to be a complete rupture or whatever else, but if you have an Achilles tendon problem, it's gonna be impossible to jump, to run, to change positions quickly. So in other words, you're not gonna be able to play very well. And this is, you know, obviously very, very frustrating. Okay, so those are a summary of the things that have been identified by the various powers that be as the quote, most common sorts of situations to deal with in racket sports. But why do some of these things occur in the first place? Why do people who play pickleball or racquetball or tennis have to worry about Achilles tendon? or have to worry about ankle sprains or joint cartilages or rotator cuff problems? Well, let's look at the causative factors. And this is a little bit interesting because a lot of these things are external and extrinsic to the human body. The causative factors have been summarized as emo, not emu or whatever else with Liberty Mutual folks or whatever, but EMO, E-M-O, standing for equipment, mechanics, and overuse. The human body is not naturally subjective or prone to injuries for any of these racket sports. It really is not. 
But what this is going to, or what we're looking at, are factors that the person can control, or at least account for, or try to account for, that can minimize the chance of injury. Or these are factors that need to be looked at if injury develops to see how they can be adjusted to help correct the problem and then prevent it from coming back. So we're going to talk about equipment, mechanics, and overuse. Now, the majority of this information comes from the United States Tennis Association because they've done the most research for the longest period of time. But it's very similar to other definitive sources authority that are out there on the internet in terms of U.S. racquetball, U.S. pickleball, and other sorts of things. But we have the most information from tennis because they've done the most work. Okay. When we talk about equipment, the big thing to be aware of is improper footwear. The USTA has found that 30% of all leg injuries in racket sports, not just tennis, all racket sports, badminton, pickleball, racquetball, squash, even table tennis, come from the wrong shoes. This points to the fact that people need to play tennis in tennis shoes. When, they, when they've drilled down further beyond the professional levels or the, you know, the competitive college levels or what have you to the quote, recreational or weekend warrior or whatever you want to call it, the biggest problem that, they ha that has been found is that too many folks are trying to play tennis or racquetball or badminton in track shoes or general sorts of sneaks or things of that regard, or basketball shoes. It's like, what's the big deal? Well, it's not a big deal in and of itself, but realize that if you're just kind of playing on the weekend, that may not be a problem. But the more you play, the more competitive you get. If you're not wearing the, wrong, the correct footwear, or maybe more precisely wearing footwear that is proper for your own individual biomechanics and anatomy, you're running the risk of developing injuries. You wanna prevent that risk? Get fitted for proper shoes. That's the big message here, okay? So basically you need to play tennis in tennis shoes. You need to play racquetball in racquetball shoes, pickleball in picketball sho pickleball shoes. Well, how do you get this situation? Well, before we get to that, it really, it really is a requirement of getting fitted by someone who is qualified for those sorts of things. We've had patients here in our practice that how do they choose their quote shoes? Well, what's the best deal at a local store? What can I find on Amazon in terms of spending the least amount of money or what have you? It's worth a little bit more of an investment to get the correct equipment because it will save time, money, and pain in the long run. Another factor with equipment is racket grip size. The USTA has found that 20% of all injuries in racket sports can be traced back to an improper grip. It's not just finding a tennis racket or a picket ball pardon me, I'm just calling it picket ball today. Sorry, that's my fault. Pickle ball paddle or a table tennis paddle. You don't want to check, you know, you don't want to select it just because it looks good or quote, it feels good. You really need to have your grip fit by someone who's an expert in that area. And those sorts of services are available through the YMCA, or through various organizations, local organized groups, where you have people who know the game, who know the equipment, and are, who are usually certified in helping folks choose that sort of equipment. Because if your grip is too big, the mechanics in terms of the forces going up and down your arm are gonna be different than if it's too small or if it's just right. It's really, some people call this the Goldilocks sort of situation. It's not too, you know, too warm, too cold. It needs to be not too big, not too small, but Goldilocks meaning just right. This will help prevent injury. Another factor involves string tension. 
USTA has found that 10% of all arm injuries in racket sports are because the, the strings are incorrect in terms of the tension. Now, I'm dating myself just a little bit, but in some of the, in the late 70s, early 80s, early 90s, there, were, there was a professional tennis player, Bjorn Borg. You might remember him because he, he was very, very good and won several Wimbledon titles. And basically he became a fad because he had his, had his rackets strung at an incredibly high tension. And basically people being what they are, well, if he has them strung very high, I need to have them strung very high. Well, what's right for Bjorn Borg is not necessarily right for Kent Tim or for John Doe or Jane Doe or whatever else. The bottom line is just because a professional does it that way doesn't mean it's gonna work for you. Because if the racket is strung too tightly or if the racket is not strung tightly enough, you're gonna get abnormal forces. When the ball hits the racket, forces are transmitted up the arm into the elbow, into the shoulder. And if those forces are abnormal, very shortly, that can cause tissue damage and result in an injury. The same would hold true for the other racket sports, because if you have a string tension that's not as efficient for the individual, you're running the risk of injury. So if you are basically modifying or purchasing a new racket, you're going to want to get strung by a professional. And the easiest way to determine that is when you do buy a racket, ask for someone to string it at the appropriate level. And if they don't know how to do that, you need to find someone who does. That's the easiest way to determine if the people you're dealing with know what they're talking about when it comes to racket stringing. So that's the E. Let's talk about the M, the mechanics. That's what M stands for. The USTA has found that 30% of arm and 20% of leg injuries result from improper stroke mechanics and footwork. Racket sports are not just about the arm, shoulder, hand, wrist. It's a total body sort of situation because you could have the best mechanics at your arm and elbow, but if your leg mechanics are not effective or efficient, you're going to run the risk of injury. The point here is being the different racket sports are not the same. Over time, you can't safely play tennis like you'd play racquetball, or you can't safely play squash like you'd play pickleball. The nuances are different. In a lot of cases, a sport like racquetball uh, requires much more wrist action than say tennis. If you're whacking a tennis ball with your wrist, you're very quickly going to develop problems. On the other hand, if you're trying to serve or play racquetball like a tennis player, you're going to have problems. Primarily from the fact that you probably won't be as efficient, you'll end up losing games more rapidly than you'd like. So realize the mechanics are different. You can't play one like the other. So in contrasting here, just think for a moment practically the differences between pickleball or platform tennis, and in this case, on the right-hand side, squash versus racquetball versus badminton versus table tennis. All of these sports are fun. All of these sports should be pain-free. But the more you play, or the higher the level of your competitive spirit, you need to be aware of problems that might develop and simple ways to solve those problems or prevent those problems. When we're talking equipment, that's getting the proper equipment, getting it fit appropriately, getting it sized appropriately. In mechanics, it's a little bit difficult because you really need someone to help you. You can't typically do this yourself. And so this is where a certified coach, a sports physical therapist, a biomechanist, someone who knows what's proper and what's efficient can help you become more efficient as an athlete. And guess what? As you're more efficient, the game becomes a bit easier. You can play a little bit longer. You have less chance of injury. It feels better. 
and things work very, very nicely. You become more efficient and with the greater efficiency comes less chance of injury. So that's how to take care of the mechanics sort of thing. Now the O stands for overuse. USTA has found that 30% of arm and 30% of leg injuries are the result of overuse. And overuse is basically too much, too long or too soon, or in some cases, not enough. The work that's been done has been found that since these games are so much fun, the natural inclination is to get out there and play as often as you can. Well, by itself, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But if you're going out there and playing multiple games of your sport a day or spending the entire weekend doing that, or uh, excuse me, or participating in a recreational tournament or something, the natural tendency is not to prepare yourself appropriately. Overuse can come from an insufficient warm up. It's usually, okay, let's go out and we'll volley a couple of times on the tennis court or hit a couple of balls off the wall on a racquetball or whatever. And then we'll try, try to start playing the game. That may be not enough of a warm up. In terms of exercise physiology and preventative medicine, you're not, the body is not sufficiently warm until you've broken a sweat. Now you might say like, well, summer's coming and we're gonna have some 80 and 90 degree weather. Maybe I'm sweating even beforehand. Well, that may be the case, but you don't wanna start cold. You want to warm up. It doesn't necessarily mean just stretching or whatever else. You need to break a sweat, not to you know uh, fatigue yourself. But so if you're breaking a sweat, that's a signal physiologically that the body is activated in terms of preparation for the game. Your muscles are flexible, your joints are flexible, everything is prepared for the activity of the racket sports. There's a natural indication or natural inclination of playing too many games. Well, you know, I played, I played a, a best out of five singles match and then I played a doubles match or whatever you want to do. And it's fun. We're not saying you shouldn't play too many games, but realize if you play too many games without giving yourself a chance to recover, the body is not an impervious system. It's got to recover. The tissues have to recover. You combine that with things such as improper nutrition, not enough protein, balanced with carbohydrates, balanced with water and fluid replacement, problems can come up. So that's the other sort of thing in terms of the emo sort of scenario, at least based upon the current information that's out there. Okay, and this was an introductory sort of thing. In summary, racket sports should be fun and are good because they help to promote a healthy love, a lifestyle, which is good for everyone. But we need to be aware of the fact that they can also result in injury, not that they must result in injury or will result in injury, but they can. And this is where folks may want to be aware of the different injury possibilities, but also the many easy ways to prevent the EMU, proper equipment, proper mechanics, and avoiding overuse. So if you are actively engaged in any of these sports and are running into trouble, just don't sit there and try to help yourself. It's a matter of contacting your primary care provider or getting a referral, a formal referral for physical therapy, or if nothing else, asking for a free screening at a Renew Clinic. So if you're having symptoms, or even if you're not and wanna make sure that you're not prone to any of these things, you have resources available out there and not all of them honestly cost you money. Many are covered by insurance, but a free screening means a free screening. And we try to do a very, very complete job and help people identify possible problems so they can help themselves. That's the bottom line. Trying to help people help themselves so they can participate in these activities without problems and with minimal risk of injury or recurrence of injury. Okay, those sorts of free screenings 
are available at a variety of different places. The Renew uh, brand is now present throughout the Great Lakes Bay region. I'm here at Saginaw and Bay Road, but these sorts of services are available at any of our other facilities. So with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions. Hopefully folks have been maybe chatting in or whatever else, or there may be some uh, questions that Kate back at the corporate office who's helping make this possible behind the scenes can ask. But before we get to that, if questions develop after the fact or after today or at some point in time, feel free to give me a holler. You can feel free to email me that's my email address or give me a call or if you're if you like the fax, you can fax that way. So we're open to input from anyone. You can agree, you can disagree, you can have ask questions. We're open, we're available, we're happy to help because that's what we're trying to do as a company and that's what I'm trying to do as a physical therapist. So with that, are there any questions? Thank you, Kent. So much good information there. Um, we do have a couple questions, and if anybody who's with us on Zoom has a question, you can click the Q&A button to submit it still, or if you're with us on Facebook, you can leave a comment and we'll ask Kent. Um, I know you covered this a little bit, but somebody did ask if they need a, a prescription from their doctor before they come to renew for treatment. That's a great question, and that basically is a situation that's changed over the course of the last five years or so. And a lot of it becomes a matter of personal preference and quite frankly, insurance coverage. Very few insurances. In fact, I'm not aware of any that we currently work with cover physical therapy services without a physician referral. And even with a physician referral, not every insurance does a comprehensive job of covering physical therapy services. Legally, ethically, we can see people without referral, but there are going to be, that's a self-pay charge sort of situation. So it's not a completely free service. However, this is separate and distinct from the free screening. We're happy to set up free screenings where we'll take 15 minutes or so and kind of go over the cursory sorts of things and help the person determine whether or not additional information or additional professional or higher level professional services are needed. There's no charge for that. But for comprehensive services from an evaluation and treatment standpoint, self-pay options or self-referral is available. There are state guidelines that govern that practice to make sure that we are doing things appropriately. But you could also, if you wish to go through a more formal sort of scenario with a greater chance it's going to be covered all or partially by your insurance, then a physician referral may be your choice. Thank so you. While Ken. it's not necessary, there are many possible avenues to coming into the renew process. It becomes a matter of what the person's choice really is. Yes, thank you, Kent. And I'll add that a lot of times the free screening can be helpful to get that referral. So um, when you come in for the screening, the therapist can send the recommendation to your doctor and then that gives them kind of a starting point um, to give you that referral too. So we did have a few more questions about footwear um, and just how do they know what shoes to pick? What kind of expert can you know recommend that? And what is the difference between tennis shoes and other racket game shoes or athletic shoes? Okay, great questions. And it's a practical matter because, you know, it's like, well, it looks good or this famous person is wearing it. I, therefore, I want to do it or what have you. Footwear fitting is kind of an art form in and of itself. Your physician may or may not be skilled in it. They may refer you to a podiatrist, or they may refer you to someone who has a special qualification or certified or is certified in shoe fitting sorts of things. It's not just going to a shoe store and trying something on and making sure it feels like or looks feels right or looks fashionable. Physical therapists can help, but in general, it means looking for resources at say a specialized tennis store or a specialized racquetball store or something like that versus a general sort of 
facility. There are places that are in the area that will do specialty screenings that have specialty uh, equipment that will help the person make a decision in terms of what kind of footwear is best for them. The other situation is these professionals who are also selling the shoes will basically say, let's try this for maybe 30 days or maybe 60 days. And if it's not working for you, bring it back. No charge. We'll do something else or try to find something else for you. In also in general, com comparing and contrasting, say, a tennis shoe versus a racquetball shoe. In tennis, you certainly have to move a lot and you have to change directions, but in general, you're, try, you're moving that over or you're doing that over a longer distance. In racquetball, you have to be a little bit quicker. You have to be able to relax, uh, react a little bit more quickly. And so it's a, more of a change of direction sort of thing. So you need a little bit different level of cushioning and support to protect yourself as compared to a tennis shoe. And this is where it gets into the circumstance or the art form of shoe fitting. It's a difficult question to answer because it's a difficult problem in and of itself. Pick a pickleball kind of falls in between and it really determines, it really is based upon what you want to do with that sport. If you're doing it recreationally or you're just having fun with it, either a tennis shoe or a racquetball shoe may be fine. However, if you are really looking at developing and possibly going on and playing tournaments, because the U.S. Pickleball Association is just exploding because there are professional tournaments, there are semi-professional tournaments, there are state championships. And even though the sport sounds like a real, you know, you know, silly like pickleball, it's serious and it's you know high level stuff to the point where they put in a petition to become a possible Olympic sport in the future. And that's no little accomplishment. So something that is serious and if people take it seriously, we need to find resources or look for things that are specific to that sport versus saying a running shoe or a jogging shoe or a you know, soft sold street shoe. It's a difficult question to answer because there are so many different variations on things. Bottom line, get fitted by a professional. Thank you, Kent. Um, I think this is the last question unless we get any other last minute ones, but somebody mentioned orthotics and said that for them, orthotics have been helpful for their running and walking shoes. Um, but if that might be something at play for these sports. Okay, great question in and of itself. Orthotics have their purpose and have their role. And it really depends upon the specific mechanics that are going, that are being involved. Orthotics can be very, very helpful, but even in and of themselves, there are many different types of orthotics from things that require special casting of the foot, special manufacture, special analysis versus some genuinely helpful orthotics that are possibly able to be purchased over the shelf or off the shelf so to speak. In general, if you're running with orthotics, if you're walking with orthotics and that's helping you, give it a try with the racket sports. You'll know after a couple of games, if it's like, oh my goodness gracious, this is something new and it's not feeling the best, chances are that particular orthotic is not appropriate for your foot relative to that sport you might need a different orthotic. And it's not uncommon that even within the tennis profession, high or high level professional tennis players who do wear orthotics have one type of an orthotic for a grass court, another type of an orthotic for a clay court, and another type of orthotic for a cement versus a composite court, have one type of orthotic for their singles matches and another type for their doubles matches. Now, granted, those are people making millions of dollars a year, but the point is there are ways to find things that will meet your needs to keep you healthy and keep you playing the games without problems. Excellent. 
I think that's all we have. Um, I'll just remind everybody that registered with us on Zoom, you'll be receiving a follow-up email that will have Kent's contact information. It will have a recording of this webinar if you wanna rewatch anything. And it will also have some links to our upcoming Rotator Cuff webinar in June. So other than that, thank you, Kent, for sharing. Thank you for your, thank you for hosting this, Kate. And thank you for all those who are part, who have participated. The bottom line is I hope you learned something. I hope this was helpful. And also we're here to help if we can. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kent. Bye everybody.